Well, as you know, we're fond of stories here at the Vinyl Cafe, and of all the stories I have heard and told over the years, one stands out. That's the story of Roger Woodward. I told the story of Roger during a Vinyl Cafe concert we recorded in Godrich, Ontario. Here it is. Well, you cannot talk about the Great Lakes as we are today on the Vinyl Cafe without talking about the greatest waterfall by volume in the world, Niagara Falls. When Charles Dickens saw Niagara Falls, he wrote that he seemed to have been lifted from this earth to be looking into heaven. Of all the things that I know about Niagara Falls, there is one true story that lifts me from this earth, a story that makes me think that I have looked into heaven. It's a story of Roger Woodward, the seven-year-old boy who, on July the 9th, 1960, was in a small boat that capsized in the Niagara River, above the falls. Wearing nothing but a life jacket, seven-year-old Roger went over Niagara Falls and he lived. I think about Roger Woodward every time I visit Niagara Falls, every time I stand on the observation deck at Niagara and I watch the hypnotically and impossibly black water roaring over the escarpment. I wonder about him and what it could possibly have been like to be in that water. Last week it occurred to me that Roger Woodward would only be 51 years old today. And it occurred to me that if I really wanted to know what it would be like, I could ask him myself. And so I set off to find him. Turns out Roger Woodward lives in a small town just outside of Huntsville, Alabama. Turns out that he is semi-retired. And when I got him on the phone, I introduced myself and I asked if he minded talking about his remarkable adventure. Do you remember it, I asked. I remember it like it was yesterday, he said. I remember everything. I asked if he would tell me his story, and he did. In July of 1960, Roger lived in a mobile home in Niagara Falls, New York. His father worked at the Robert Moses Power Plant as a carpenter. His father worked in construction, so... The family lived where the jobs were. We were very much a blue-collar family, Roger told me. We traveled from one place to the next, from one job to the next. Roger told me that he has a sister, and her name is Diane. Diane's birthday is July the 5th. And to celebrate her 17th birthday in 1960, a family friend, Jim Honeycutt, offered to take Roger and Diane on a boat ride. Jim had a small aluminum fishing boat. There wasn't room for Roger's mom and dad. July 9th, the day of the ride, was a beautiful sunny day in 1960, and Jim and Roger and Deanne set off down the Niagara River from well above the falls. Deanne was in the front seat, her brother Roger behind her, Jim was in the stern, and there were two life jackets on board. Roger wore one of them. They tucked the other one under the front seat. Roger says he remembers moving peacefully down the river in that little silver boat, remembers passing under the Grand Island Bridge, which is only a mile upriver from the falls, and which many see as the safety point of no return. Roger had no idea of safety points, however. He didn't even know they were anywhere near Niagara Falls. didn't understand that just one mile ahead, the river he was traveling on would tumble over the falls. It would be a day later after he had followed the water over the edge before he understood that. So the little fishing boat passed under the Grand Island Bridge, the point of no return. And Roger says he remembers the faces of the people in other larger boats, says he remembers thinking they looked concerned, probably because such a little boat was about to enter such a dangerous part of the river. Ahead of them, Roger saw what looked like a small white island. It was, in fact, a shoal, small piece of land peeking up from beneath the water, and it was covered with literally thousands of seagulls. The little fishing boat he was in hit the shoal, and suddenly there was no thrust from the propeller. Suddenly they were in trouble, because the current was picking up, and the boat was starting to drift in the current down the river toward the falls. Jim yelled to Deanne to get her life jacket on, and then he took out the oars and he tried to regain control of the boat. The waves, however, were getting big. Now, the average flow of the Niagara River at Queenston is greater than the Fraser or the Columbia or the Nelson. And that little boat was hit by one wave and then by another, and then the boat flipped. It happened so quickly that Deanne had only managed to get one of the straps of her life jacket done up before she hit the water. 
Roger had his jacket done up, but it was an adult-sized life jacket, and he didn't know how to swim. And his head was throbbing. Later doctors would tell him he had a concussion. And so it was in this state, Roger, seven years old, unable to swim and wearing nothing but a giant life jacket, and Deanne with her life jacket halfway done up, and Jim with nothing at all. And so it was in this state that Roger, Deanne, and Jim hit the rapids. Within seconds, they were torn apart. Within seconds, they had lost sight of each other. Roger wouldn't see his sister again for three days. He would never see Jim again. Roger still had no idea that he was heading towards Niagara Falls, that he was tumbling through some of the most powerful rapids in the world. Roger says that this was the worst of it. He says his head was slammed against the rocks and that he was sucked under the churning water and shot back out again like he was being blown out of a whale's blowhole. Says he couldn't see anything. His sister, Deanne, knew that she had to swim with the current if she was going to reach the shore. And that's what she started to do. Battling against the strong water and the weight of her life jacket, feeling like she was swimming through peanut butter. And just when she thought she couldn't do it anymore, just when she thought that she was over, she heard a voice. It belonged to John Hayes. John was on land on Goat Island, the island which separates the American Falls from the Canadian Falls. John had seen the capsized fishing boat whisk by him, and John knew that if there was a boat, then there must be people too. That's when he spotted Deanne struggling to get to shore. Of all the people watching, John was the only one to take action. He ran down the riverbank to get himself in front of the little girl, and then over the roar of the Niagara River, Deanne heard John's deep, strong voice calling to her. Come to me, girl, he said. Come to me. The falls were only a hundred feet away, but his voice gave her strength, and she could see John Hayes reaching out, extending his arm over the barrier that was protecting him from the water. John reaching for Deanne, and now Deanne reaching for John, and they miss because she's moving too fast. So now John has to get ahead of her again to where he thinks Deanne will be. He has to outrun the powerful water that is carrying this little girl along. He has to get in front of her, and he's running out of land himself. He runs down the bank, and he gets himself into position just feet in front of the big drop. And he folds his upper body over the safety barrier, and he reaches out again, getting there just as Deanne comes flying by. He reaches way down, and she reaches way up, and she catches his thumb. John has her now, feet from the falls, but all he has is her cold, wet, slippery hand, and all that she has is his thumb. And John doesn't want to pull too hard because he's worried if he pulls too hard, she might lose her grip. And he screams for help, and another man, John Kotrowski, a truck driver from New Jersey, runs up, and the two men reach down, and they pull Deanne up by her life jacket. And the first thing Deanne did was ask about her brother. Where's my brother, she said. And that's when John looked out into the river, and he saw Roger Woodward's seven-year-old head bobbing up and down like a tennis ball. John leaned down and he whispered in Deanne's ear, and Deanne put her hands together in front of her heart. What did he tell her, I asked. He said, you need to say a little prayer for your brother. You need to say a prayer. So Deanne put her hands together in front of her heart, and she began to whisper a prayer, praying for Roger, who was still being thrown around by the rapids. He was panicked and terrified, unable to gain control of his own body in the paralyzing force of the river. Couldn't see anything. He still had no idea where he was. He just knew he was moving fast, just knew he was out of control. As you know, if you have been there and stood like I have and stared at the water, you know the Niagara River starts to flatten as it approaches the lip of Niagara Falls. When we spoke on the phone last week, Roger told me he remembers that moment when the rapids ended and the water smoothed off. I was finally able to catch my breath, he said. I was finally able to look around and see where I was. What Roger saw was that he was moving swiftly towards the edge of an abyss. What he remembers is looking at the shore. 
A crowd had gathered on the riverbank. He could see them watching. And the panic and terror that he had been feeling just seconds before turned to anger. Why weren't they doing anything to help him? And then seven-year-old Roger Woodward looked ahead, and his anger turned to submission. He was at eye level with the falls, just feet from the lip. He still had no idea it was Niagara Falls in front of him. He couldn't see the drop. He just knew he was approaching a void, a vast area of nothingness. And that's when he realized he was going to die. What did you think about, I asked. I thought about my dog, he said, and about my parents, and about my toys. Roger says he remembers wondering what his parents would do with his toys when he died. He said he didn't think of heaven or hell because he had never heard of them. And then, he says, he felt at peace. And that's when he dropped over the edge of Niagara Falls. He told me when he went over, he felt as if he were floating, floating on a cloud of mist. He said it felt like he was suspended in the mist. There was no sensation of falling, he said. My stomach didn't jump into my throat. There was no smack when I hit the water, no rocks, no pain, just mist. Next thing he remembers is coming out of the mist and seeing the maid of the mist, Turbo. The captain that day was Clifford Keach. One of Captain Keach's deckhands thought he spotted a child in a life jacket, and though they couldn't tell if he was alive, Captain Keach decided to take a risk. He steered the maid of the mist off course. Roger was now in the current again, so Keach had to anticipate where the rough water was going to take him so that he could be there at the same time. And he was. And they threw a life ring to Roger. But he missed it. So they tried again, but Roger was tired and bruised, and he missed it again. On the third throw, it landed right in front of the boy. And he flopped his arms around it, and they towed him up and on to the maid of the mist. Roger remembers the nurse who looked after him at the Niagara Falls Hospital. He even remembers her name, Eleanor Weaver. She brought him chocolate milk, he says. It was Eleanor who told Roger that he'd gone over Niagara Falls. And yes, he's been back to the falls. A few weeks after the accident, Roger went out on the maid of the mist with Captain Keach. He says it was the first time he realized the magnitude of what had happened to him. He says he was terrified. A few months later, his family went to Atlantic City. It was Roger's first time on an airplane, and the the pilot knew that Roger was on board, so it's a special treat. Pilot flew the plane over Niagara Falls. (laughs) Roger said he became hysterical. I was afraid the plane would fall, he said. I was afraid I was going to have to do the whole thing all over again. (laughs) Roger's family left the Niagara area a year after the accident. Roger didn't return to the falls again for 10 years until he was a freshman in college. He came back with his father, and he says as an adult, the falls didn't seem as big as they did when he was a child, not quite the monster he had seen years before. After college and marriage and kids, Roger ended up in Farmington Hills, Michigan. And he and his family used to spend their holidays touring the Great Lakes on their 42-foot yacht. He says he didn't often think about that Saturday afternoon so many years ago, but sometimes, sometimes when he was standing on his boat and looking down at the water of Lake Huron, he would get a pang in his stomach, knowing that the water that he was floating on would flow from Huron into the St. Clair River and from the St. Clair River into Lake St. Clair and from Lake St. Clair into Lake Erie and then eventually, inevitably, become part of the violent rapids of the Niagara River and on its way to and over the falls. Mostly, he said, it didn't bother him a bit, just sometimes.